God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, call us to set our sights on the goal of following and living in the way of Christ. God calls us to follow us now, you now. I do welcome you all to our Wednesday service, of which I believe they are really encouraging, helping us to grow into our faith. May God help you as you listen to these messages, as you meditate upon the word of God during the week, so that they help you. The word of God will help you in your Christian journey. And once you listen to the word of God, once you dedicate your life to the word of God, listening to the word of God, your life will never be the same. It will definitely be changed. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, who calls us to follow? We are on journeys, individual journeys, shared journeys, experiences that are ours alone and ours together. Guide us on our journey this day and help us to keep our eyes on the goal. Help us to remain focused, Father. As we journey towards the goal you set before us, we see glimpses of who you are, often too deep and imaginable to grasp fully the depth of your being. What we see and feel spares us on in our journey and discover more of you. Thank you, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. I will call Brother Ben to come and read from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4 to 11. Morning, family. I hope you're having a wonderful week. Uh, it's a great day to be able to um, hear the Word of God on Wednesday. Uh, today, as Johnson mentioned, we'll be reading from Philippians 3, 4 to 11. So, though I myself has reasons for such confidence, if anyone thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more, circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the top tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was in my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Wow, awesome verse. So um, now we'll get Johnson back to hear his bit of gold and what this verse means. Have a blessed week. Thank you, Brother Ben. Uh, brothers and sisters, I'm going to share with you on the theme, your wake-up call your wake-up call. One of the small luxuries that used to be available in most hotels was the personal wake-up call. Remember when the hotel clerk would ask you when you check in, would you like a wake-up call? Most major hotels offered the service. The next morning, right on time, you'd get a call from a real-life person who woke you up with the words, good morning, Mr. Jones or Ms. Jones. This is your wake-up call. And then you will decide whether to go back to sleep or not. That task, like everything else, is now assigned to computers. Few hotels offer a personal wake-up call. These days, many people use their cell phones as their alarm clocks. So the idea of a wake-up call seems outdated. Other hotels send a butler with coffee, tea, and pastries to knock on your door. 
That idea would definitely get me out of bed, especially receiving a cup of tea in the bed. What does it take you to get you fully awake and ready for a new day? Are you one of those people who wake up easily and jump out of bed? Or are you one of those people who need to be shaken awake and kicked out of bed before you can start your morning? If the second description sounds more like you, then you will relate to today's sermon from the scriptures. It was written by Paul, a man who needed to be shaken out, awake and kicked out of bed. But he didn't need to be awakened from a deep sleep. He needed to be awakened from a way of life that was leading him far away from God and closer to death and destruction. Ironically, it was a way of life that looked on outside like a great success. Paul, whose Hebrew name was Saul, was an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. He had a respected family heritage. He was a student of the law of Israel. He studied under Gamaliel, a respected Pharisee. Paul was educated, influential, and respected. By all measures in his society, he was a success. And he had a singular goal in life to protect the Hebrew law. That was his call, to protect the Hebrew law. We need to note, first of all, that successful people usually have worthwhile goals for their life. If you want to honor God with your life, if you want to make sure that you don't waste the precious gifts God has given you, then the best thing you can do is create some worthwhile goals for yourself. Goal setting comes from the belief that your life is a purpose. If your life were random and meaningless, then setting goals wouldn't make sense. But because your life was at a purpose, you set goals. But if your life has purpose, if you have the opportunity to make an impact in your own sphere of influence, then setting worthwhile goals is the best way to do it. Worthwhile goals require vision, they require planning, they require discipline, they require sacrifice. Successful people have a vision of where they want to go and who they want to be, and they create a plan to get them there. At one time, Paul proudly sought his own worthwhile goals. He described himself as being zealous of God. Zealous isn't a word we use so much anymore. It means being enthusiastic, passionate for a cause. Paul wanted to honor God and his religious heritage as a member of the tribe of Benjamin. That is what he wanted to do. So he demonstrated his commitment to these goals by carefully studying the Hebrew law and by persecuting those Jews who didn't strictly obey the law. Particularly this new sect of Jews who followed a dead rabbi named Jesus. So he wanted to eradicate them, to torture them, to punish them. He even participated in an act of mob violence when a crowd of equally zealous Jews turned to death a Jew, young leader named Stephen. By his own standard, Paul was very successful in achieving his goals. But what does it mean if you are very successful at achieving the wrong goals? Because for me, this was wrong goals. John Crapper is a mountain climber, a best-selling author of books about his climbing adventures. So in his book, Into Thin Air, he writes of the day in May 1996, when he finally reached the summit of Mount Everest. A number of his fellow climbers had died along the route. So John wrote, I understand on some dim, detached level that it was a spectacular sight. I had been fantasizing about this moment and the release of emotion that would accompany it for many months. But now that I was finally here, standing on the summit of Mount Everest, I just couldn't summon the energy to care. That's interesting. What did you do when you finally arrive? And the thrill that you thought you would get from pursuing your goal is not all that great. Sometimes our goals and our definition of success need to be pried out of our hands before we wake up to what's really important. Many of you know that it's like to have a wake-up call like that. You are consumed with thoughts of promotion at work, 
until you get the call that your child is in the emergency room. You forget about all those things. And you change, you rush to the emergency room because you are now thinking of your son. You are now thinking of your daughter. So your priorities get sorted out real quickly at a time like that. And that's what happened to Paul. While on the road to Damascus to arrest more followers of Christ, Paul, who was going by his Hebrew name Saul at that time, was struck blinded by a flash of light from heaven. And that is what happened. And he heard the voice of Jesus asking, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul spent three days in Damascus, blind and helpless, questioning the direction of his life. Have you ever spent time questioning the direction of your life? How can we be sure that the goals we are pursuing, the goals we are giving our time, strength and energy and life to are truly worthwhile? What happens if we achieve our goals and discover that we spend our lives in pursuit of what was not God's highest choice for us? And what do we have to lose to discover what God really made us for? From a young age, Stephen Sutton, a native of the United Kingdom, born in 1995, dreamed of becoming a doctor. But when he was diagnosed with bowel cancer at the age of 15, his dreams changed. Stephen started a blog on Facebook and wrote a bucket list of things he wanted to accomplish. Among those items were learn to juggle, skydive for charity, get my name in the Guinness Book of World Records. As Stephen's cancer progressed, he also added to his list the goal of raising £10,000 for the Teenager Cancer Trust, cancer charity in the UK. And he selected one more goal, to inspire someone else to become a doctor since he could or wouldn't live to fulfill that dream. Stephen's blog inspired people around the world. He had the opportunity to speak at numerous places and even met British Prime Minister David Cameron. He had an amazing impact on everyone who came into contact with him. Unfortunately, Stephen passed away in 2014 at the age of 19. But people continue to donate to the Teenager Cancer Trust in his honor. As of 2017, five million pounds have been donated in honor and memory of Stephen Sutton. It is amazing how one young man's worth will go not only had a positive effect on others, but it lives on after him. That's the power of a truly worthwhile, God honoring God. And that brings us back to the story of Paul. Paul had encountered Christ on the Damascus road. And after three days of blindness, Paul was healed through the intervention of a follower of Jesus named Ananias. At that moment, Paul's previous goals for his life began to look like a lot of garbage. That's how he describes his previous life goals in today's lessons. It's rubbish. He, he said, it's rubbish. All is rubbish. But whatever we, we gain to me, I now, whatever we gain to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. That is what Paul says. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing work, worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. I consider them rubbish. That is what Paul is saying. Later in this same passage, he declares, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Still later, he sums up his new goal. I press on towards the goal. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. I forget about the past. I press on towards the goal. That is what Paul is saying. He's saying the past is rubbish. It's nothing compared to what now I have. Compared to my new life in Christ. Now Paul had only one goal, to save Jesus Christ. That is, was his now goal. Wouldn't it be great to have only one goal in life? One goal that you knew in your bones was the purpose of God made you for. 
This is it. You were made to save Jesus Christ. You were made to live out Jesus' values and priorities. You were created in the, in the first place in the image of God. So you needed to save Christ. You were made to do good works that express the love and hope for Jesus Christ in the world. And if God made you for that purpose, then it is only in saving Jesus Christ that you find your identity, peace, and fulfillment. No other goal satisfy your life in the same way, only in saving Christ. You remember that story. In order for God to heal him, the prophet Elisha told Naaman he had to remove all his armor and bathe himself in the Jordan River. Laura made the point that Naaman had to humble himself, give up his symbols of strength and protection, and submit to God's plan before he could be healed. Washing in the dirty water, because he compared the Jordan River according to the other rivers he had in his own home. If you wanted to move forward in life, if you want to accomplish something significant in life, then you've got to set worthwhile goals for yourself. That's what successful people do. But if you want to honor God with your life, if you want to make a positive impact, an impact that lives after you are gone, then you need to have only one goal in life, and that goal is saving Jesus Christ, who is your personal savior. It doesn't mean you need to be a missionary in a foreign country or a Christian worker in the inner city. It doesn't mean that you will seek to be the person God means for you to be wherever you end up. No. It is what you were made for. It is what you were made for. It is where you will find identity and purpose and peace. It is the one thing that will make the most difference in the world. Serving Christ and Christ alone. That is what you should be doing. Make it your goal. All things are rubbish. They are nothing. They are nothing. Because when you die, you never take anything with you. Your minds, everything, you leave them. Your home, you leave it. Your, your precious car, you leave it behind. Other people use it. So you have one goal. And that goal is to save Christ. Only Christ in your life. No matter what it costs, you will never reverse forward Christian soldiers. That is the goal. Forgetting what is behind and marching on to get it. May the good Lord bless you as you listen to this message. As you understand what Paul was saying to the Philippian congregation, encouraging them to say, press on towards the goal. Press on. Don't look behind. Press on towards the goal as you are running forward every day of your life. May the good Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we are all so different. Each our being, and yet you love us and care for us all. You nurture and protect us. How can we not be thankful to you for all that the journey we with you offers. We thank you that you guide us in an unexpected way to find the right way in life. We thank you that when we wander, you draw us back to you, give us new direction, encourage us to follow where you lead us. We thank you that you know our, our individual needs and quirks and yearn for us to be on the journey of life with you. We thank you that the pains of life can be overshadowed by the joy of walking with you. For all these blessings and more, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. Let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.